His commentary on Genesis, uh, he, he, kind of series. he gave this kind of summary of what Austin, what the book about the gang of God is about. And listen, I think this is spot on to what we've been talking about and how it applies to us, how the Genesis applies to us in our recent days and commentary in our program. In order to be an effective witness for Christ in our nation, we will have to go back to the Bible and learn and present our case as the Bible itself. That's a great action to live with anger of To present Christ as the Bible again. Not that Christ is to me. Not a God of my understanding. But the Bible is biblical presentation. Beginning with the doctrine of God is created and explaining how human beings are created and God did. And are therefore responsible to God for what they do. In other words, we must recognize that our world, listen to this, is a spiritual, daily, and patient as the world in which God's gospel is raised, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we must present our message as the God of the dead and the What a great thing. The only prescription for our world, the only prescription for you and me. For our struggles, even as believers, as children of God, is scripture, is the word of God. That, that's in our that's our cue for our neighbors. And that's what Carson explained in that book in the Gagging God, talking about how the secular world does not want to hear what the Bible says. But that doesn't mean that we change what God's word says so that we can feel the thought. We trust God's word to do his work. And what a great peace that is. What a great reminder. And we see this, exactly we see this in chapter 12. We know we finished up chapter 11 last week. In that first couple thousand years of human history, we kind of ran through that in 11 chapters. And now, for about the next 20 chapters, we're going to talk about 25 years. Because God is zeroing in on this. And we chose the man in his treasure possession, the nation of Israel. And we see the beginning of that today in this passage in chapter 12. We're going to cover those first nine verses. So if you want to find that in your Bible, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 9, if you don't have a copy of Scripture, there's one there in the few right here. I think we're about to say 14, and that is the very beginning. But that is the Beginning of God's family right here is this chosen family, the nation of Israel right here in chapter 12. In this, in this passage, in these nine verses, we're going to see two major things that we don't want to get. We've already spoken of them in our singing this morning. We've talked about them in our pastoral and prayer confession, but in our call to worship people. But what we want to remember is the nature of God's word. We're going to see a couple of traits about God's word that we want that God brings us to remember to And also the proper response to God. The nature of God's word and as humans, what the proper response to that word is, especially as God's children, what the proper response to that word is. And this is all counts. You know this in Genesis chapter 12. This is where God first mentions his covenant later. It's all counts in his promise. We just sang so beautifully, y'all did. As I mentioned longer than I've ever heard you sing, standing on the promises of God. And this is, these are the promises right here. The promise of Abraham to go out and feed his family and all the nations of the world. So let's hear the word of God and follow along as our reading. Genesis chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go to your country, your kindred, your father's house. To the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, so that you can be a blessing. So I will bless you, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse, and 
in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, and the Lord had told him. So Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Rome. And Abram took Sarah and his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired from Herod. And they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, to the over the Lord. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land, and the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring, I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethlehem. This is him with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord. He called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going to the Lord's name. Join me in prayer as we ask God to bless you in this time. The apex of our worship that we hear from his word and that it might do its work in our life. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you again. And may we not discount the opportunity to come and be the Creator God's community. And voice to you, God, our imperfect prayers to a work of God. God, we thank you for what we've already been blessed by this morning, God, and being able to hear your word, and being able to say the truths of your word in song, God. And to have beautiful messages accompany us so that we might worship and praise you, God, not us, not to draw attention to us, but to praise and worship you. God, that we might give of all the bounty you've given us, that we might give back so that we can learn to be a giver of our children. God, all these blessings have already been ours in this gathering. We thank you for that. God, we pray now that as we hear from that word, as we hear the promises, the precepts, the laws, the commands that we have already read about in worship and worship, we pray, God, that you will use the Holy Spirit to stir our hearts, stir our souls, so that we might be more obedient to you, and that we might live our lives in accordance with what you want us to do. We pray that it will be right. You will thank the people of him of this sermon, and that you will make them right. That your Holy Spirit to die and the resurrection of Jesus. And we pray for you in the mighty and everlasting faith of you. For God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. We see this familiar passage for many of us that have been in church in the time of Genesis 12. That's the beginning, as they said. For God's family is the beginning of the Abraham's covenant. And even though the word is used here, it will be used in a couple chapters over for God's official command of the covenant. But God is a covenant making God, as we've already talked about. We go back to the language he used in Adam and the, the command and the promises he gave Adam. If you go back to Noah and the command and the promises that he gave Noah, you're going to see that same language, very similar language here with Abraham. What Abram is doing. And this is this is where we see these truths of the nature of God for a couple of things, not everything. We can't give an exhaustive sermon on God for in just a few minutes. But the nature of two things about God's word. And then what the prophet's response to that God is and to that word is. And how that applies to us today. Even something written thousands of years ago. We see first that remember Abel, we just talked about him last week, we read him each week. He's the tenth generation from Shem. Remember Shem was Noah's son that Noah in chapter 9 pronounced the blessing. He got this blessing and curse thing. We've been talking about this for several weeks. God intends to bless man, but in his discipline, he has to curse man with all the rest of And we see in chapter 11 in the Tower of Bible, we see all the curse that goes on in the Tower of Bible. Today we're going to begin to see the blessings will come through that curse. What a, what a magnificent God. How, how he 
can be loving and just at the same time. He can be gracious and merciful and a disciplinary at the same time. Areas that we know as humans, if we've ever been in any position of authority as an aunt, an uncle, a parent, a grandparent, a great grandparent, but an older brother or sister, anytime we've had authority, it's very hard to do both of those correctly. Or not those perfect. All the time. During all the time. You see that here it manifests itself in chapter 12. You see Abram and you see who was that? We just see this man called out in the genealogy. We see many names in him. Who was it? Well, Joshua refers to him at the end of his book in chapter 24 Joshua. Where this promised land that we hear of things in this passage today, Joshua is taking them into Moses and dying. Joshua is taking over the headship of the family of Israel. And he has taken them in to the promised land. And they have they have slaughtered many of the people of Abraham so that God can set his people in their name. Because he promised that back here in the beginning of Genesis. That I would have a place. I would have a land. And that's what he does in Joshua 24 2. He referred to him and said, Joshua said to all the people, Thus said the Lord, the God of Israel. Long ago, our fathers lived beyond the great deeds. Care of the father of Abraham and Nabal, and they served other gods. So, what was Abraham? He was not God. He was a pagan. He was lost as lost as ever. He was a rebel of each other. He was living out in the desert there with his flocks and herds and his family and his connected clan, locked his nephew. And he was he was living there worshiping the God. Because that's all he did. Because just like any of we've already talked about this morning there and I before I call worship and I call the ship these days, is many people there are worshiping false God because they've never heard of Jesus Christ. They don't know. They've never heard the gospel. And so we see this right here, the reality. The reality of all the world, we are worshiping the cross of God until we are in the beast of the world. And that's what they were. So he was a, he was an idolater. And now we see Jesus, excuse me, God come in here in chapter 12 in Moses' account. Verse 1, now the Lord said. That's an important phrase. If you go back to Genesis 1, God brought the world into being with that word. The Lord said, He spoke this world into being. He spoke the sun into the sky. He spoke the stars and the moon into the sky. He spoke all the creatures in the sea and on the, in the livestock and the herd. He spoke that into being. Day and night. And we see that. We've already referred to that many times. We're going back to Genesis 1 and those many uh, verses 3, 6, 9, 11, 14, 20. And God said. And what that tells us about God saying that. It is a command. God is not giving the son a, 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 a choice whether or not to come out of the end of He's not giving all the creatures of the sea a choice about whether or not to create. He is creating. He is commanding them to be born. He is commanding them to be created. To come to life. It is a command. We must understand that. God, God's word, he speaks in commandments. Uh, no, there's no wasted verbiage in your books. You can go to any chapter you but there's no wasted verbiage. Everything you hear is for a reason. God not, he's not a God of small minds. He doesn't want to just kind of tell you how you do it. He's not interested in it. He's the creator. We are the creation of the creature. And he is giving us instructions. It's not a bad thing. We think it's a bad thing because we hear from man. It's a lot of time. Really? Those commands are so that we can flourish. That's God's whole people of man. To be blessed and flourish. And so he gives that command there. The command in the Lord said. This is also the same language that God uses in salvation. God called us out. Remember Lazarus? Go to the book of John, the Gospel of John, and see 
all the time the power of God's word. Then Jesus said, well, remember Lazarus when he died in John chapter 11, and Mary wanted to go to go to Jesus and bring him and say, Die, die, he's the best friend of God. What does God say? What does Jesus do? Does he do a dance and get some incense and rub a and throw it up in the air and jump to a lot of things? No. What does he say to Lazarus? Come out. Come forth. What did Lazarus do? He got up. The dead man got up and walked out of the tomb. Because God told him to. That is the power of God's word. When God calls one in salvation, he said, What do you mean God calls one in salvation? Paul in chapter 4 of Ephesians. He switches those first three chapters. He's talking about God. And then he tells us how we're supposed to live in the end of verse 1. Paul, I therefore, Christian Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of what? Of the call to which you have been called. If you are a child of God this morning, if you are in Christ Jesus, if you have been born again, if you are a disciple of Christ, God did. God called you in the He gave you the gift of faith. Paul says in Jesus' He gave you that. He made you. That is the word that we're talking about here. And the Lord said to Abraham, keep all that in mind. What did he say to Abraham? Go from your again a command, not a choice. Hey, Adam, if you would want, you can go away. Right no. He said, Go. Go from your country and your kingdom in the promised land, the land that I will show you. Meaning I'll give it to you on a need to go back. Do not tell you everything. I am giving you that. This is this is God's calling a pagan. Out in the wilderness worshiping other gods. And God picked it. Thank you. 
whose word is making it not to you. We can simply bless you simply that he is lovingly and graciously called us into the partnership, into the relationship. We see it again in Isaiah 45 7. He read the first many times. I form life and I create darkness. I make well being and I create freedom. And in the Lord who does all this. Folks, I want you to understand why, why yes, it is a command word, it is an authoritative word. this is God's child, the human consciousness, that should be a great comfort. This is your father. You don't have to say, I had a great, kind, loving father. He said the same. He didn't do everything. I'm sure your case was the same. My father was on the earthly father's name. These commands we can trust, just like we talked about in our uh, pastoral faith. We can trust those things. We can trust God's precepts, His laws, His commands. They are for us. Don't miss that, folks. And that's what He shows to to Abraham right here. He goes on, and and what we see in in verses 4 and down from this in chapter 12. How did Abram respond? Well, Abram responded correctly. Now, he's not always going to respond correctly. We'll see this in the next week. But right here, initially, he responded correctly. We see in chapter 4, excuse me, verse 4 of chapter 4. So Abram went. God had issued this command to pick up all his family, all his loved ones, and go, and I'll show you where to go. I'm not giving you a GPS. You're not going to have the map stamp. You're not having anything. Just go. Blind lead blind, except it's not blind lead. It's not. If Abram did it, so Abram went as the Lord had told him. Where have we seen this before? You remember Noah? You remember Noah, the only righteous man in the land? No good at all. No good. We didn't hear Noah speak to the end of chapter 9 before now. He built an ark in 120 years. He went through a flood for another year. And we didn't hear the four minutes. We need to hear this. The 
church today is not, oh yeah, I took care of that. That when I was eight years old, I went down and took the preacher's hand and I said the prayer. And I, now I live however I want to live. And somebody calls out their sin and they oh well, I, I took care of it. No, no, no. If you were in Christ Jesus, there is no choice in the world. There, there really shouldn't be any other desire other than the world. Sure, we struggle with sin and we're going to fall. But there should be a quick run of what we learn in our prayer of confession about the part of Christ to run to him and confess that so that our fellowship can be restored. But that of these is exactly in line with belief. If we believe, we're going to bed. Our practice of living will be a deed and not just not doing what I want. It's not, oh, that's just the way I need. Mean. That's just a bad habit. This is critical for our church today, for the world to know today, but especially for the church. You see, uh, in verse 7 to 8, in chapter 12, moving down to that, the baby goes, Then the Lord appeared to Abraham. So he's spoken to him, now he's appeared. Now he didn't see God like, like uh, Moses and asked to see God in that time. He saw God in some form, an angel of the Lord, or something the way God appears in time in Scripture. But he gave a big world appearance to me. Because Abel had followed his word. He passed his promised land and went to Shechem. And then in verse 7, then the Lord appeared to Abel and said, To your offspring, I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord, for he appeared to him. From there he went to the hill country from the east of Bethlehem. Bethel on the west, down the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord. And here's the phrase. He called upon the name of the Lord. We've heard this before, have we not? In Genesis chapter 4, 26. Remember Cain and Abel, and then Adam knew his wife again in Seth. And we see that in verse in Genesis uh, 4, 26, where he said, and he called, and this time people began to call upon the name of the Lord. There was worship. The altar, there was no tabernacle, there was no temple, God had not given that yet. But the altar was a symbol of worship. And that's what Abraham did. He built the altar there to worship. So his response to God's word, number one, was obedience. Number two, was worship. Obedience and worship. Obedience and worship. Folks, that should be our watch. If we are a child of God, it should be to obey this word, this precept. You cannot obey something you don't know. I can't obey God's word if I don't know God's word. That's why it is inherent that we must study God's word. Here again, this isn't jam. It's not going to pull up a few for entertainment. But this is the line for the Christian life. To know God's word. And if we have been born again, if that spirit is in us, that would be our desire, folks. More than the things of the world, more than the selfish things and getting my way, it is going to be to be followed up and tell me when that manifests itself in me, in my relationship with my wife, in my relationship with my children, in my relationship with my grandchildren, in my relationship with my brothers and sisters that I go to church with, in the relationship that I have with people who don't know God in the world. How can that That should be our purpose. To worship God, to obey God, and in that, we give our worship. That we glorify Him for what we have said. Mark Luther, about this passage, he said this in his prayer prayer for us Let the word of the call be our chief concern. For this alone produces true meekness and worship that is pleasing to God. We have been called as Abraham was, and he was given those promises. We have been given those promises too. We're going to see this in the next several weeks as the covenant unfolds between God and Abraham. But we see ultimately, and we know this because we're seeing it, it culminates ultimately by God's people. It culminates in God's people. Because Abraham said, I will make your name great. I will make a nation 
the slave seed blessing. This is a man who was 75 years old and married one. And God promised him, I will make you a father of How does that happen? You don't know what it to be done. God calls you. God brings you. And he culminates in the plan he had for the earth with the resplendent of it. Paul so does he says this in Galatians 3, the close of that chapter, verse 26, who hears it from me, verse 26, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God, through faith. For as many as you were baptized into Christ, get put on from us. If you've been saved and you've walked through the baptismal waters, then you have put on Christ. You are in union, as Paul says in Romans 6. You are united with Christ. Verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. That's not saying God's throwing out gender, like some current people would say, I'm not going to be careful, I'm not poor. But that, that's not what God's doing. He's saying that there is no faith to God. If you are in Christ, it doesn't matter if you're male or female. It doesn't matter if you're Jewish or Greek. It doesn't matter if you're black, white, Indonesian, or if it doesn't matter because he is the God, the Father of every tribe, every nation, every tongue, every nation. And we are one in Christ Jesus. That's what he's saying to us. He ends verse 29. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs of Basically, a desert wilderness. He took me and passed me through the promised land. He said, No, no, you're not going to live there, but you're an offspring of the world, of which you had none. You're an offspring of the world. And then I will bring all the nation, a representation of all the nation of the world. Thank you. 